Hello, greetings, fellow time travellers. Great to have you with me. I always say that, but I mean it. it. Comes from the heart, and the more the merrier. And everyone, everyone that comes here is uh, it, it, well has something in common. We're all interested in history. Uh, we've all got questions to ask about what's happening now, and more and more of us are seeing that so much that happens now has happened in some form or another before, and that it's therefore instructive to pay attention, even to events thousands of years ago. You know, there being nothing new under the sun, you can see that whatever, pestilence, war, famine, death, have always been with us. And people have found ways to outmaneuver the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or at least to survive their presence. And and so must we. Uh, you know, this one, this this episode that we're about to embark upon together is about ancient Egypt and about the fact that then is now, or now is then, great building projects, whatever else they were about, whatever philosophy was driving them, whatever cosmology was being manifest in those pyramids and temples, they needed bureaucrats <laughs> and accountants to, to get the keep the wheels in the wagon, to organise the workforce, to keep the food coming and the water and the wine. Uh, it's It was ever thus. But before we get started on that episode, I just want to say the eternal thank you to everyone who, who shows their support for uh, for what Paul and I are doing here for the podcast series. And the, the, the wellspring from which it all comes is is the my presence on patreon.com. Uh, it's the financial help that comes from there that enables everything else. Can't operate without it. And the and the more the more Patreon subscribers that we have, the more we'll be able to do, the more this uh, endeavor can grow. So uh, if you're already a Patreon uh, follower, if you're already a Patreon, if you're already a patron of Patreon, huge thank you. Uh, if you're not, but you'd like to uh, become a member, then it's easy. Just go to patreon.com, search for me by name, Neil Oliver, and part with a bit of cash, basically. You can join for the month, you can join for the whole year at once, and it is cheaper if you go, it's cheaper by the dozen. But it's up to you. Um, and as well as helping support the podcast series, you'll get access to special stuff, question and answer sessions, competitions. You also come into contact with one another. Paul and I love to see all the, the, the correspondence and communication and contact that goes on within the group. Uh, so get in there, and I'll hope to see you there. Okay, that's the advert over. Now it's time to strap into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop in my love letter to the world. And it is a love letter. Recorder, microphone, action. The life-giving power of the Nile was his to command. The gift of life was his to give to Egypt. Deals done, money agreed and accounts signed off. Before words were used for poetry and laws, they kept count of what was owned and owed. Right across ancient Egypt, bureaucrats kept tally. Unprecedented organisation on a skill never seen before or anywhere else. Supporting the pharaohs and a civilization which lasted for 3,000 years. These faceless officials who history often forgets were the people who made the wonders of the world possible. Endeavouring to understand history and what's gone before in order to help protect the future. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the world. Hi Neil. In the last episode, we heard the stonemason's chisel ring out as Hammurabi laid down the law. Where in the world are we this week? Well, we're staying in the part of the world that's been called the cradle of civilization. Uh, but instead of walking with poets and lawmakers, we're heading back to the office to meet a powerful bureaucrat called Rikmir. We're on the west bank of the River Nile, opposite Luxor, as the entrance to Rikmir's tomb is being sealed to hide the treasure within. 
We're in ancient Egypt. No story of the world, no history of the world would be worthy of the name without Egypt. Um, I, th I think we've established in the first couple of episodes probably that the history of the world starts in that part of the eastern Mediterranean, the, the, the Fertile Crescent, the Levant, Mesopotamia, whatever you want to call it. But it all starts there. That's where the domestication of animals and crops started. It's where we've already established that, as far as we can tell, the first writing was achieved, was attempted. And it's, it's with writing that we get the birth of history. Uh, because for the first time we've got written records. It's also, though, worth stressing, it's, it's tempting because of, when you mention early storytelling, of course everyone thinks of things like the Old Testament, you know, the, the creation myth, Genesis, Exodus, the epic of Gilgamesh, which we've touched on. And of course, in episode one, we talked about the poetry, the hymns of Inheduanna, who was a high priestess of a, of a temple in the city of Ur, in Sumer, in Mesopotamia. And, and so it, it, it's tempting to think of writing being invented for that reason. But the more pragmatic point of view would have it that in all likelihood, writing probably mattered, first of all, as a way of keeping track of crops and wealth and other necessary things. You know, that once you have uh, civilizations forming around strong men and they're, they're running everything off the back of surplus food. So they're, they're bringing people together, uh, they're centralising as they go, they're probably in control of the crop that's produced every year, they distribute the crop and they pay the specialists, the craftspeople, the soldiers, all of the people who make civilization possible. And because of that, keeping track of the incomings and outgoings of, of the civilization are probably the most important of all. So for every Inheduanna, or indeed the, the unknown author of the Epic of Gilgamesh, there were probably many more scribes, bean counters, bureaucrats, whatever you want to call them, but people who were keeping an eye on the wealth of the nation or the wealth of the king, let's say. Because that's what I mean. A, a king or a pharaoh may well have enjoyed reading praise of himself and, and reading stories about what a fantastic individual he was. But it, it probably mattered at least as much, if not more, to him to find out how how his wallet was doing, his bank account. So that's probably the the kind of writing that that mattered most of all. First of all. <laughs> So, here we are in ancient Egypt, one of those early civilizations from which sprung so much else. And, I mean, how do you begin, in the, in the course of a single half hour or whatever, how do, you, how do you do justice to Egypt? Well, it's difficult. It's a civilization that lasted for 3,000 years, at least. You know, 3,000 years, definitely, but there was a, a spread of time before the beginning, and then there was a, a long, slow decline, effectively, after the end. So it's more than 3,000 years, really, when you get right down to it. But it's it's an extraordinary slice of time. I suppose we have to set down some basic ground rules about how we're going to think about Egypt. In many ways, because it's spread across such a, an expanse of time, it's quite a good idea to have in your head the idea of a layer cake. Think of a, a sponge cake, you know, assembled of layers. Egypt is a cake with three big sponges, three layers of sponge, of three different flavours, to be fair, separated by two thin spreadings of jam. <laughs> okay? <laughs> the layers of sponge represent times of success, Consolidated government, order out of chaos, but they're separated by two intermediate layers of formless, chaotic jam. When things fell apart, to do with internal and sometimes external trouble. So let, let's think about a, a, a layer cake. Five layers, three big bits of orderly sponge, 
separated by two periods of chaotic jam. That's the sort of mental image. Egypt, once upon a time, more than 3,000 years BC, so more than 5,000 years ago, there were two kingdoms on that territory along the Nile. It was always all about the Nile. There was no life in that part of Africa without the fertility provided by the annual flooding of the Nile, which spread fertile sediment across the fields and literally spread life on either side of the, of the river. So more than 5,000 years ago, there were two kingdoms. The lower kingdom was where the, the River Nile entered the Mediterranean Sea. So at the estuary, where the river kind of spread out into the threads of, you know, lots of little rivulets going out into the Med, that was Lower Egypt. Further back upriver was the Upper Kingdom. Okay, so they were separate. Mythology, more than history, really has it that around 3000, 3200 BC, a king called Menes, Menes is king of the Upper Kingdom, and he goes to war with the Lower Kingdom and conquers it. And so for the first time, around 3000, 3200 BC, Egypt becomes one place. As I say, Menes is, is possibly more mythological than real. But there, there, must have been, there must have been a king. There must have been someone who achieved what had hitherto not been possible. But it may well be the fact that the two kingdoms just came together out of mutual necessity. It may simply have made, made sense for the boundary between the two to blur and, and for the whole thing to become one, but it, it happened under one king. To begin with, Pharaoh, that also familiar word Pharaoh, referred to the location of the royal court. So Pharaoh was the palace complex, really, and in addition to the, the palace complex, it would have been a place of ritual where priests and, and others performed the rituals and, and, and got on with the business of, of worshipping the pantheon of Egyptian gods. And that was Pharaoh. Ah, so it wasn't a person? Not to begin with. Pharaoh originally referred to, to the place where the royal court and the, and the presence of the religion and the, and the ritual, that was Pharaoh. That was the, the time of the Old Kingdom. You know, that first big thick layer of sponge is the Old Kingdom. Then you've got a layer of jam, then you've got the Middle Kingdom, and then you've got a layer of jam, and then you've got the New Kingdom. So by the time of the New Kingdom, the Pharaoh refers to the man. So that evolution is spread across hundreds of years. You know, before you get from what had previously, what had originally been the, a place, but by the by the time of the new kingdom, it's become the man. The old kingdom was was centred on the city of Memphis, but it's about twelve miles south of Giza in Greater Cairo, if you like. That's the capital of the old kingdom. Gradually, though, its influence waned, and by the time of the new kingdom, Thebes the city of Thebes, which was in the Upper Kingdom, comes more to the fore. There was a bit of uncertainty about where the capital of Egypt actually was, but to all intents and purposes, the focus by that point was on Thebes. Now, really, we should take a pause to think about the fact that we, everyone tends to think about Egypt uh, in a very specific way, were preoccupied with the great monuments. You know, at the mention of Egypt, everyone thinks about pyramids, the Valley of the Kings, Tutankhamun, you know, the death mask of the king, uh, mummies. We think of a, a civilization that's really sort of preoccupied with death, which to some extent it was. You know, there, there was an extent to which Egyptian thinking was a kind of a was a kind of a preparation for death. It's overburdened by the fact that the, the cemeteries, the, the places in which the dead were stored and put were in the desert, which apart from anything else secured their survival. The extreme dryness of the conditions there and the construction of the tombs meant that the things that are associated with the rituals of death survived better than the, the things which were to do with the everyday stuff of life. We see it through a kind of a, a, a warped prism. 
that makes us think that Egypt was all about death. They undoubtedly had complicated and sophisticated ideas about death, but we see less, we have tended to see less of everyday life, and that has coloured things. And so it's important to remember that in in more recent times it, it has been possible to pay more attention to the life of Egypt rather than the death that went on in Egypt. Everyone knows about the Valley of the Kings, Der al-Medina, which, let's say by about 1200 BC, there was a whole city, really, that was populated by and lived in by the people who were creating the tombs of the kings. All the craftspeople, all the labourers, you know, they they had to go somewhere. And in, in more recent times, this settlement has been discovered and excavated. And, it, it, you know, it brings everyday Egyptians much more to life. You know, vast quantities of discarded pottery, the, you know, the furniture that they used, the, you know, the things that they sat on, the things that they slept on, you know, the pottery, which gives an indication of what they were drinking, what they were eating. And so, you, you know, finally, we've, we've, in more recent times, we've, we've begun to glimpse the minutiae of daily life. There's records kept, excavated records, which talk about, you know, the problems of hiring donkeys for the, you know, for the day-to-day work. And there's, and there's people writing to one another about infidelities, you know, people gossiping, people writing about, you know, whose wife has slept with whose husband and all the rest of it. So, you know, for in much more recent times, there's been much more of a sense of of Egyptian society as being a, a, a colourful place, a place of life as well as a place of death. We're dealing in this third moment in the love letter to the world with the the tomb of a vizier called Rikmir. Uh, in Egyptian society, the vizier was Pharaoh's most senior, most trusted advisor, rich and powerful in his own right. This particular vizier, Rikmir, is the governor of Thebes. Okay, so he looks after the running of Thebes really on behalf of Pharaoh. Rikmir was vizier to Tutmos III, and then after Tutmos III died, he continued that role for Tutmos' son Amenhotep II. They were pharaohs of the 18th dynasty, which was really the dynasty that stands for the new kingdom really being established and confident. It was the time of the greatest extent of Egyptian power, talking about the second half of the second millennium before the birth of Christ. So those pharaohs are in at the beginning of Egypt coming to a real peak of its power over all. And so Rekmir, as vizier to those some of those pharaohs, was a very powerful individual. And when he came to die, he was buried in a tomb that he had had, you know, created for himself. So the moment in question is the closing of Rekmir's tomb. It's an extraordinary work. It's a rock-cut tomb in the city of the dead, Sheikh Abd el Kurna, which is located on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes. What you have to imagine in terms of the tomb layout is, if you picture a letter T, a capital T, the entrance to Rekmir's tomb is in the middle of the top stroke so if you imagine entering through the top of a T lying on its you know lying flat on the sand and you're you're coming into an entrance in the middle of the top stroke and so directly opposite is a long chamber stretching away in front of you which is the long leg of the T and then on either side you've got a left hand and a right hand chamber which are the two halves of the top stroke it's all cut into rock And while the light of day is still in the interior of the tomb, the walls are covered in paintings and text which depict and describe the life and the role of Rikmir, the vizier. And collectively, they give a a hitherto, an unprecedented, an unprecedented glimpse of the life and times of the vizier of the pharaoh. They are a powerful and an illuminating glimpse. Apart from anything else, they show what it was that Rekmir was doing for Pharaoh. Because, as I said at the top, Egyptian society was possible because of 
a careful accountancy, the work of careful bureaucrats. The bureaucrats in question were trained at a special school in Thebes and they were deployed from there and they worked all throughout the kingdom. You know, the texts uh, describe what was expected from a good bureaucrat, from a good scribe. Shrewd and cautious judgment, self-control, conscientious study, respect for those higher in the chain of command. But above all else, absolute respect for the sanctity of weights and measures. Because to get things done in ancient Egypt on the scale that was achieved, you know, the building of pyramids, the creation of the rock-cut tombs in the Valley of the Kings, all of those works depended upon highly sophisticated organisation of vast numbers of people. All those people had to be gathered together, their work had to be coordinated, they had to be fed, they had to be watered. To keep a civil engineering project running is all down to the sophistication and the organisational skills of the bureaucrats. And, you know, in the case of Rekmir, he was overseeing all of this. You know, the buck stopped with Rekmir. He was overseeing all of that effort. And what is depicted in his tomb, it's, it's called the tomb of Rekmir, but he's, his remains are not in there and never were. Rekmir's mortal remains were located elsewhere. What this tomb contains is a record of who he was and what he did. And so, more than anything else, it's a, it's a record of the kind of stuff that was coming in for Pharaoh, that was being brought in from the, from the agriculture on, on either side of the Nile, and it's also what was being uh, brought to Pharaoh by people coming in from subject kingdoms, you know, people that owed tribute to Pharaoh. So you get, you know, you get this depiction of incense trees from the people of the, of the kingdom of Punt, uh, baboons and monkeys and animal skins, Uh, giraffes and leopards, uh, tribute from the people of Kush, gold, ivory, pots, carts, weapons from Syria, horses, elephants, bears. The commanded wealth is endless. There are scenes of tribute from the Egyptians of the Lower Nile uh, and on the Mediterranean coast. Elsewhere we see what Rekmir was overseeing in, in terms of the preparation of food and offering for the temple complex at Karnak. Also uh, panels detailing the work of the craftsmen that he commanded, carpenters, decorators, goldsmiths, masons, sculptors. Uh, Other scenes show fishermen, hunters, winemakers. Taken collectively, the artworks and the texts are, are called the installation of the vizier. And they provide in that one place the most detailed description yet discovered of the role of a vizier in ancient Egypt. And so the moment in question is the closing of that tomb. All of that work had gone into preparing that space, which after all was going to spend an eternity in darkness. All that colour, all that vivid depiction of life, all of that boasting of Pharaoh's wealth, uh, and at the same time boasting of Vizier Rikmir's organisational skill, it was all going to spend an eternity of darkness. And so the moment in question is when the, is when the door is closing on that tomb for the last time and the, you know, the spread of darkness, you know, darkness spreading like the darkest lacquer across scene by scene by scene by scene as the door is closed for the last time. It's an extraordinary effort to go to, to tell eternity, really, what Rick Muir had been all about. So are the drawn panels on the walls a bit like ancient Egyptian cartoons? Uh, well, I mean, they're a, bit, they're a bit better than cartoons. They're just faithful depictions of life. We think of Egypt being about the dead. The walls of Rikmir's tomb show the life of Egypt. You know, it's dynamic and active. There's a depiction of a ritual called the opening of the mouth. This was a, a, where there was a, a statue which was a representation of Rekmir. Uh, the statue's mouth would be opened to show that, all things being equal, Rekmir would eat and drink in the afterlife. And then there are, close by the, the, the representation of the opening of the mouth, there are scenes of the, the so-called beautiful Feast of the Valley, which is another ritual which celebrates the dead. 
and it's all about a beautiful boats uh, on the Nile. They convey hopes of the revival of the departed into the next world, and everything about it is colour and life. It's more than 300 square yards of stories in pictures and in text. And, and all, of that, all, of, all of that was created just to be consigned to never-ending night. But the point, I suppose, really, why it's worthy of, of paying attention to it, you know, what is, what is being depicted there is the role of the man, his responsibilities, how much wealth he was capable of bringing in for Pharaoh, all of the craftspeople whose work he oversaw. Because, you know, what you have to remember, hidden, lost, really, in the story of Egypt is what made ancient Egypt possible. And what made ancient Egypt possible were the bureaucrats. It's not necessarily glamorous. It's not necessarily the most exciting occupation. But the the only way in which a civilization on the scale of Egypt was possible was down to coordinated, organised labour. And that was the work of the scribes. And the scribes themselves had to be coordinated. And their coordination was down to an individual like Rick Meir. And so you've got in that snapshot, lost in that tomb for all of those centuries, is the beating heart of Egypt. The work of someone like Rick Meir and the people that he coordinated, invisible though they are to us, was how Egypt was created and how Egypt was able to sustain for 3,000 years. It was a feat of organisation. Egypt's an enigma. I mean, you know, it's it's bound up in that almost childish, cartoonish way that we think of Egypt. You know, the, the mummy from Boris Karloff onwards. You know, the idea of, you know, being pursued by the bandaged figure. The preoccupation with death. I mean, to some extent, what we see of Egypt, what we see of ancient Egypt is a tomb. You know, the pyramids are the, are the biggest gravestones on, on the face of the earth. You know, it was, to some extent, a place preoccupied with death, but in the earliest times, the only person in the Egyptian way of thinking who had an afterlife to look forward to was Pharaoh. And only Pharaoh. Everybody else, when they died, was just going to disappear in, back into the dust. Gilgamesh, he of the epic... Uh, you know, he his the epic of Gilgamesh is his search for, amongst other things, eternal life. But by the end of the epic of Gilgamesh, he has learned that eternal life belongs to the gods and to the gods alone. You know, the lesson he has learned is that whatever else he might achieve, eternal life is forever beyond him. Well, in Egypt, it was different. Pharaoh was wedded, you might say, to the River Nile. Everyone in Egypt understood that Egypt depended on the Nile. Without the fertility of the Nile, there was nothing. And somehow or other, Pharaoh became the embodiment of the fertility of the river, of the life-giving power of the river. The the life-giving power of the Nile was his to command. The gift of life was his to give to Egypt. And only he was promised an eternal life. And he was not a man. He was a god. Unlike the situation for the, for the rulers in places like Mesopotamia, in places like Sumer, in cities like Ur and Uruk and Babylon, invisible around them and above them were the gods. In Egypt, Pharaoh was life. Pharaoh was a god. There were other aspects to ancient Egyptian life which set it apart. Places like Memphis, places like Thebes, they started out as the as the royal court. Pharaoh was the royal court. But even by the time of the of the New Kingdom, by the time of, of people like Tutmos and Amenhotep and Vizier Rekmir, the cities were essentially well they weren't cities. Essentially they were they were the place of the royal court, they were the places where the priests conducted their religious rituals, but they never evolved to true urbanization. They weren't places where other people lived. They were places apart. The mass of the Egyptian population, you know, lived in villages, scattered through the landscape, 
and may have been summoned to and may have come to places like Memphis and like Thebes for special occasions, but they didn't live there. But the proof of it is in the way it was able to sustain. Uh, you know, as I said at the top, you know, you've got these three layers of of the sponge cake, these, these three times when there was consolidated government, when there was order. Each of the three was different, but they all represent periods of, of order and cohesion. But they were broken up by these, I mentioned these periods of, sort of formless, chaotic jam, because there were times when the internal organisation of, of Egypt fell apart. After the Middle Kingdom and before the New Kingdom, there was an intermediate period when Egypt was ruled by foreign kings. Kings from, from outside Egypt were in charge. The name given to them is Hyksos, which is an Egyptian word, or it, or it comes via ancient Greek, and it seems to mean something like the foreign kings or kings from foreign lands. You know, so there were periods when control of Egypt got away from the Egyptians themselves. Times of turmoil and chaotic periods or periods when they were ruled by outsiders. For example, the rule of the Hyksos, you know, there, are, you know, there, were, there were several there were dynasties of, of Hyksos kings who ruled Egypt. And then they in turn were overthrown and the new kingdom of Egypt was established. And then you get the time of the Tutmos kings and Amenhotep and the rest. Do you think it's important to bring these people's stories back to life? I think they're just absolutely, they absolutely deserve acknowledgement. Egypt is an exercise in organisational genius. The great civil engineering projects that were undertaken, the building of the pyramids and the temples and the rest, you know, they were undertaken by people who had really, by our standards, by anyone's standards, a rudimentary understanding of maths and engineering. You know, they, they didn't have the wheel. It was simple technology that they had, but they were able to, to do so much because of the organisational abilities of the scribes. They understood the power of bureaucracy, the office job, how much could be done if it was properly organised. You know, the Hyksos, when the Hyksos came in, they apparently brought in wheeled chariots and the, the Egyptians watched, they watched the Hyksos and they saw the, the fairly primitive chariots that the Hyksos came in with and then they took them for their own and they developed they developed the chariot to its its finest flowering and it was egyptian armies armed with chariots that defeated the hyksos and drove them out and enabled the egyptians to take back control of egypt so they you know so they were adaptive and they learned but so much of what was achieved in ancient egypt was done with very simple technology and it was more than anything else it was an achievement of organization it was scribes, bureaucrats, marshalling the labour of thousands upon thousands of people, finding ways to bring them together, finding ways to organise them, finding ways to feed them and water them. That was what made ancient Egypt possible. Office workers. Transported hundreds of miles across dangerous open ocean, scattered across the islands of the Yap Archipelago, thousands of beautiful hand-carved circular stones, valued for their stories, unmoving and permanent, the visible magic of money brought to life, and now, thousands of years later, echoed in our 21st century lives. Next time in my love letter to the world, to help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. My YouTube channel is simply called The Neil Oliver Channel. And to build this podcast, please tell your friends about it, get them listening and write a review to convince the online crowd to join us. For further reading about these moments in time, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the World in 100 Moments and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Milo McKinnon. Social media and YouTube producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>
This has been an FBF Podcasts production.